Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Anthony Lestardi. I am a slideshow presenta presentator, and I'm also a freelance writer. I'm an avid movie fan as well. And today, we're going to be doing a presentation on film movies that influenced the slasher film. And I should point out that this is my first time doing a presentation during the pandemic, and I'm really happy to do this, even if it's only virtual. I'm glad that you're all here to see this, and I hope you have a great time. This is known as Sharpening the Blade, the films that influenced the slasher. The slasher is a classic genre of the horror world during its golden age of the 70s and the 80s. They were treated with a very unique kind of villain. Whereas people were normally scared of monsters in the night, vampires and ghosts, the slasher featured a masked human killer. More realistic, and therefore, more scary. They had signature weapons, so they're usually a household item, and there was a whodunit mystery, as well as a why done it mystery, who the killer was and why were they doing this, and there was often a final showdown between the last victim and the killer, the victim known as the final girl. Nowadays, slasher films are outdated, yet this Halloween, or as in the round of times that I do Halloween, I watch films I watch the slasher films, it's an annual thing, as, as with all horror film fans. And we often see modern day horror films like Happy Death Day that takes slasher films and the elements and puts new twists on them. But as I watch these movies, I have also watched the films that influence them. What we usually have is a party of young people, usually teenagers or college students, that are stalked by an, a mass killer or if he doesn't have a mask, he's often unseen, usually with his hands and his point of view reference. A graphic string of murders follow. Again, they usually have a murder weapon that is usually a household item, like a kitchen knife. And the climax is usually the showdown between the killer and the last survivor. And it's there. The why, the who done it, is revealed, as well as the why done it. And then, you know, right after that, even when the showdown is over, there's that final twist like the killer making an unexpected turn, turn, return, additional victims or survivors, or even a foreshadow to a potential sequel. That almost never happens. <laughs> Here you can see a list of particular movies. You got Maniac, Slaughter High, Happy Birthday to Me, The Prowler, Slumber Party Massacre, Sleepaway Camp, The Burning, Terror Train, Friday the 13th, and April Fool's Day. <laughs> Some of them have funny titles, some of them have distinctive titles, stuff that looks like a parody. Mm. But they all have great, <laughs> they're all great movies. Mm. To explain the horror scene of the time during the 70s and 80s, you have to also understand what was going on in the country. There was the end of the peace era, the end of the counterculture, there was the Vietnam War, and we also had the Beatles with the British invasion vans. There was also the Watergate scandal, the Iran hostage crisis, and the Challenger disaster as well as the deaths of Elvis Presley and John Lennon, you can pretty much see all these events having a mixture of influence on the slasher film and showing you what anything was happening in our country at the time. There were also several trends in the 70s and 80s, not just the slasher. There were psychological thrillers like Don't Look Down, Straw Dogs, supernatural thrillers with archicult films like The Omen and The Exorcist, there was a wave of low-budget gore films like The Evil Dead by Sam Raimi. There were a trend of vampire films like Fright Night and The Lost Boys. We recently went through another trend of vampire films with True Blood and the Twilight films a decade back. There were also little monster films like Gremlins and Creditors. And then there was also the new genre of the body horror, which was often pioneered by David Crotenberg with films like The Brood and The Fly. But the thing that people were really scared at that time was the mass killer. Because unlike the other stuff that happens in these other genres, this stuff can actually happen in real life. Mm. The first film that I like to talk about that influenced the slasher is And Then There Were None. What we have here is a group of ten strangers that are sent to an isolated island. Murders occur, the mystery thickens, and they discover connections between one another. Each member has committed a crime that they did in past fact, and as their numbers get smaller, they find out there's a killer among them. 
and tensions go high. A slasher film is essentially a whodunit mystery. It is also a why done it mystery. As the bodies get higher, you're always hunting for clues to find out what was it that caused these murders and what is it that made the killer the way he is. Suspense is created with every killing, creating a sensation of eeriness and impending doom. There's this theme of the Ten Little Indians nursery rhyme that adds a tune of innocence to the horror atmosphere around its subject matter. And that's been repeated in a lot of horror films, not just in the slashers like American Psycho, A Clockwork Orange, and it's repeated in other genres like Reservoir Dogs. You may remember that there's a famous torture scene, and as that torture scene is going on, you have Steeler's wheel stuck in the middle with you that contrasts the graphic nature of the scene. What I'd like to show you now is a video clip, or should I say the trailer, of Then There Are None. Like a little world of its own. How would you like to spend your last days here? Oh, no thanks. I think a weekend will be enough. Yeah, ten little Indians. One choked his little self and then never nigh. Uh -huh. Go on. One never slept himself and there were eight. Mr. Owen is one of us. You have to do that. I'm just studying Mr. Owen's little scheme. Maybe you know how the general was killed. My dear Bloor, can't you read? Eight little Indian boys traveling in Devon. One said he'd stay there, and then there were seven. Seven little Indians left. Six. One is bogus. Correct, sir. One of us is Mr. Owen. Which one? Seven little Indian boys chopping up sticks. One chopped himself in half, and then there were six. There are five of us left. One of us is a murderer. Get it. Another film that influenced the slasher, The Spiral Staircase. Its biggest feature is The Final Girl. The Final Girl is known as the purest victim among the group. Normally a clean-cut woman, clean woman who doesn't do drugs, and she's a virgin. I mean, she's pure. There were also early prototypes of other slasher characters. There's a handyman in his house keeping wife who represent the naive, gossiping schoolmates. There's a verbally abused home nurse who represents the misunderstood outcast. There's a housekeeper with a taste for the brandy representing the party girl. And there's the spoiled rich son who is usually the, who represents like the fool of himself football jock. You know, all those classic characters that you see in either a high school or a college setting that all become victim of the slasher. And even Ethel's Barrymore's character, she takes on the, pro the Prophet of Doom, which is a character that was often the prototype of Ralph in the original Friday the 13th, foreshadowing the doom of everything that was to come. Mm -hmm. There was also other features, common tropes that were featured in this movie, such as the killer wearing black gloves, his point of view shots, 
and jump stairs. In here is a trailer of the spiral staircase. The Spiral Staircase, starring Dorothy McGuire, George Brent, and Ethel Barrymore. With Kent Smith, Rhonda Fleming, Gordon Oliver, Elsa Lanchester, Sarah Allgood, and Reese Williams. A flawless cast acting a story of flawless fascination, giving full range to the artistry of Dorothy McGuire in a role so unusual, so compelling, so fraught with emotional power, no other actress would dare play it. An inspiring portrayal, destined to become her most distinguished screen triumph. Helen, I don't want to frighten you, but because of what happened in town today, we have to be especially careful for the next few days. If you see anything outside of this house, or even in it that makes you suspicious, as I want you to let me know. And don't hesitate to call me at any hour if you need help. The Spiral Staircase is an absorbing, dramatic experience of such gripping conflict, artful suspense, and daring realism as to make it a screen achievement unlike anything you've ever seen. Next movie, Peeping Tom. This movie has been called a mistreated masterpiece that was condemned by critics and audiences and it destroyed the career of director Michael Powell. You may remember him with movies like The Red Shoes, but after this particular movie that was controversial for its subject matter, it really much in the end of his career. It is said to deal with the British culture anxieties regarding sexual repression Fraternal obsessions, vulgarism, and perverse violence. It's all told for the killer's mission to film and capture fear. Always filming his victims and seeing how their reactions when he tries to kill them. It's taken further by the movie-loving Peeping Toms that we ourselves, when we see things from the killer's point of view, often emphasizing that theme that us moviegoers are essentially perverts ourselves, going into the movie theater to watch the lives of other people kind of makes you look at reality TV a different way. <laughs> there were also other slasher tropes that were in the movie, such as the killer being a psychopathic byproduct of a sick family, murder victims being beautifully, beautiful, sexually active women, and the locations of the murders not being in terrible places. And here is a trailer of the movie. Peeping Tom. Look out! Look out! Look out! Take care. You are being watched. We repeat, take care, for you are now alone with a killer. We warn you, don't let him see the fear in your eyes. For this is what he seeks, and this is why he kills. Where are you? Look out for Carl Byrne as the peeping Tom. Fear him, but pity him also. <laughs> it's so good. Watch out for Moira Shearer as the lovely stand-in who innocently dances into danger. Imagine. Someone coming towards you who wants to kill you, regardless of consequences. A madman? Yes. Wait! Anna Massey is the girl who falls victim to the charms of a lonely stranger upstairs. Switch it off, Mark! Mark, switch it off! Maxine Audley as the blind woman who senses the danger that threatens her and her daughter. 
but he's helpless. Don't be frightened. I'm not frightened. Hot. So put that camera away. There is no future for anyone who tries to befriend him. He invades the privacy of innocent people till the piercing eyes of his camera meet the terrified eyes of his victims. And with a compulsion akin to madness, he shoots the final fearful scene. And speaking of Peeping Tom and the audience movers being known as perverts, the person who is credited with that anthesis is Alfred Hitchcock and his movies like Psycho. Psycho had sent a new level of acceptability for violence, deprived behavior, and sexuality in films. Its influence can be easily seen through Halloween by John Carpenter. Again, we have the killer's point of view. We have an emphasis of suspense over gore. And there's a kitchen knife used by both of, the, both of the killers. It also features an iconic music score that often is intimidated in other slashers. And shall we also for, not forget that Jamie Lee Curtis, the star of Halloween, is the daughter of Janet Lee, the star of Psycho. It seems that violence and sexuality sum up the exploitive nature of slashers in the years to come. The next film on our list is Blood Feast. The first thing I gotta say about this movie is that it has everything that a bad movie has. It's got bad acting, bad cinematography, bad lighting, and heck, even bad makeup. The consistency of the blood is very pasty. You would think it's ketchup. But definitely, you should still see it. It's still very entertaining and interesting to watch. It's been known for its groundbreaking depictions of on-screen gore considering it the first slasher film featuring visceral violence and explicit gore that is said to have a huge influence on the torture porn genre of the 2000s. By, that was led by the Splat Pack, making movies like High Tension and Hostile. Its director, Hercel Gordon Lewis, is often considered the godfather of gore, which he shares with Italian director Lucio Vocini, known for movies like House by the Cemetery. It's also been influenced on the horror phrase um, with its uh, being part of the Blood Trilogy. Lewis made two other films called 2000 Maniacs and Color Me Blood Red. And its main villain of Blood Feast, Freud Lamsey, he's often considered the original machete-wielding maniac before Jason Voorhees in Friday the 13th. And here is a trailer of Blood Feast. It even comes with a warning. In fact, during its time when it was first released at drive-in movie theaters, audience members were given vomit bags, you know, to make it look like it was really scary, <laughs> to scare the audience. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you're about to witness some scenes from the next attraction to play this theater. This picture, truly one of the most unusual ever filmed, contains scenes which under no circumstances should be viewed by anyone with a heart condition or anyone who is easily upset. We urgently recommend that if you are such a person or the parent of a young or impressionable child now in attendance, that you and the child leave the auditorium for the next 90 seconds.
going outside America, we're going to head to Italy to see the Italian giallo movement with movies like Bay of Blood. There were movies other like Cat of Nine Tails, Suburbia, Dressed to Kill. These were generally mystery thrillers that concerned an outsider, like a tourist, going on vacation, and they witnessed a murder and they were forced to solve it themselves. They were defined by their vibrant colors, mass killers, stylized settings, a hum emphasis on human psychology, and their progressive synthesized bass soundtracks. Its director, Mario Diva, he is credited in making the first Giolato, mm. the girl who knew too much. And it has, but Bay of Blood has an emphasis on exploding killings, contrast with a beautiful lake-like setting, lakeside setting. And that was like a trend that became a common trope in slasher films. Beautiful, scenic places. That was a good contrast with the graphic murders. The examples were include The Burning, which took place at a camp, April Fool's Day, Sleepaway Camp, and Friday the 13th again. Mm -hmm. it's, in fact, its murders were so influential that for Friday the 13th Part 2, two particular movies, murders were copied. Its movies, the movie's nonsensical narrative, its beautiful landscapes and bodily mutilations continue to inspire horror, horror film directors worldwide. And here, you're going to see a clip, not a trailer, a clip from Bay of Blood that, is, that was kind of taken by director of the Friday the 13th Part 2. And here is the murder that was copied in Friday the 13th, part two, also using a machete. The Flesh and Blood Show. We go to a different kind of genre known as exploitation. By definition, this is a movie that is intended to attract an audience through exploiting certain trends, niche genres, and sensational, lured, controversial content. What do we get in this slasher? Gory murders and a lot of TNA. I mean, with a title like that, The Flesh and Blood Show, you know what you're in for. <laughs> Its director, Peter Walker, was a 70s exploitation pioneer, and he wanted to make sure that his moviegoers got what their ticket, what the price of their tickets. He made movies like Frightmare, 
House of Mortal Sin, Schizo and the Comeback, which combines exploitation with slasher elements. And here we have another particular story about a group of people isolated on a particular location, a bunch of actors trying to do a production, and they're stalked by a killer. And there's also another murder mystery. <laughs> what we get is an array of se sexy teases, followed by graphic killings, and another whodunit mystery. Young people being murdered becomes a theme in Walker's later horror films, which focuses on youth culture being attacked by older people. We don't have a trailer for this particular movie, but moving forward. Torso. We go back to the Italian Giallo movement, and we have here another whodunit mystery, and another mass killer with point of view shots. These victims are a bit different, they particularly are college co-eds, and they are either portrayed as sexually active, scandal-capped, or simply free-spirited women. Slasher films are often accused of being sexist, while others defend them, saying that they contain strong, independent female characters. And the killer is often portrayed as a victim of past trauma, driving them to commit murder as a form of release or retribution. This influence goes beyond slashers, including the new French exterminatory movement with high tension, and modern, modern thrillers like Black Swan and Neon Demon. And again, we don't have a video for this one. Here we have personally my favorite horror film of all time, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This one set new levels of gore standards in all movies. It characterizes the slasher killer as a huge, hulking, faceless person and seemingly devoid of any humanity. The use of power tools and everyday items as murder weapons was also influential, in this case a chainsaw. And the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is actually often considered allegorically a clash of cultures, the ideals of the counterculture area with the dark conservative values of the average nuclear family. Contemporary values are often symbolized by the victims and their graphic deaths are representing the end of those values. The killer is not only seen as a sympathetic trauma victim, but also the product of past cultural values conflicting with contemporary values. What happened was true. The most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America. survives what will be left the texas chainsaw massacre after you stop screaming you'll start talking about it the town that dreaded sundown like the texas chainsaw massacre this movie was portrayed as a true story which was a common trend in movies during the 70s particularly crime dramas and thrillers one example was Walking Tall. This particular movie was based on a real-life serial killings known as the Texacana Moonlight Murders, similar to um, Son of Sam, where couples were murdered in the moonlight in romantic settings. And this killer was known as the Phantom Killer. This movie was directed by Charles B. Pierce, 
who was a pioneer of independent cinema. He was also known for another movie known as The Legend of Boggy Creek that combined drama and documentary elements. Here we also have documentary elements in the town that dreaded sundown to a point that it's made its way into local folklore with annual screenings around Halloween around the uh, place where it was filmed. It also had graphic and darkly creative murders including the famous trombone scene. It's killer also if you look at its picture, if you look at the poster doesn't he look familiar? Before he wore his famous hockey mask Jason Voorhees wore a bag over his head in the first movie, Friday the 13th, part two. And here is a trailer for the town that dreaded sundown. Samuel P. Fuller, age 24. Linda Mae Jenkins, age 19. Brutally attacked March 3rd, 1946. Howard W. Turner, 29. Emma Lou Cook, 17. Bodies discovered in a wooded area on March 24th. Roy Allen, 17. Peggy Loomis, 15. Both found dead April 14th in Spring Lake Park. Floyd Reed, age 34. Murdered in his home on May 3rd. Mrs. Reed shot twice, but survived. This man's identity is unknown. He was believed to be between 30 and 40 years old. He wore a white hood and was known only as the Phantom Killer. World War II had just ended. In Texarkana, Arkansas, boys had come home to their families. Husbands reunited with their wives. It was a happy, peaceful time. Until the phantom killer struck. For four months, he held an entire city in the icy grip of terror. Now, Charles B. Pierce brings this incredible, shocking, and true story to the screen in The Town That Dreaded Sundown, starring Academy Award winner Ben Johnson as Captain J.D. Morales of the Texas Rangers. We got a cold-blooded killer here, a man who nobody sees, a phantom who so far hasn't made any mistakes. Andrew Prine as Deputy Norman Ramsey of the Texarkana Sheriff's Department. The only thing we really do know is that we've got a very strange person on our hands. <laughs> the Town That Dreaded Sundown, a true story. Black Christmas. You may remember Bob Clark for directing another Christmas movie, A Christmas Story, which was a lighthearted, family-friendly comedy, but this one was anything but. This is widely considered the original first slasher. It had mixed reception in its day, as most great films do, but new praise has generated over time for its plot devices, its masterful tension, and its suspension, as well as its acting performances by Olivia Husky and Margot Kidder. It also has very similar features in common with Halloween. It had a holiday setting. Its opening scene has the killer's point of view. It's in moral youth characters, taboo subject matter, and a predominantly female cast. Even to this day, it stands out as a uniquely terrifying among all slashers even to this day. And what we're going to see here is not a trailer, but a clip of the opening of Black Christmas, which you'll see is very similar again to Halloween, with the killer's point of view that was all filmed in one big take.
Oh, by the way, how come I was the only one there working tonight? We were there this afternoon, Barb. A likely story. How's it look? Eulish, very Eulish. Have you got your Santa Claus suit ready? Yeah. What time the little bastards arrive? About one o'clock. Terrific. Hello? Pardon? Who? Bob, it's for you. Long distance. Oh, great. Hang on, I'll take it in the other room. And now, finally, we get to the close to the end, John Carpenter's Halloween. Now, this was the movie that was considered the first slasher film that started the Golden Age. That was from particularly 1978 to 1942, 1940, 1984, excuse me. And there you see all the regular slasher standards. Point of view shots, signature murder weapon, memorable music, Victims as sexually promiscuous, substance abusers, and there was the final girl, the innocent pure one, played by Jamie Lee Curtis. And this also had mixed reception, praise to the direction, acting, and music, accused of encouraging sadism, as well as being mis misinformed, being sexism. Early platform for feminism, too. And it's often considered a social cliche and the immorality of American youth, considering that the victims are usually the ones that are immoral, and the ones that survive are the pure kind. And it's often been considered a, considered a commentary upon the dangers of suburbia. A lot of times a horror film was in a classic setting like castles in medieval times or out in the woods. This takes place in the modern day suburban neighborhood. The mass killers are the new, from this day forward, masked human killers are the new boogeyman for the 70s and the 80s horror. And here's the opening scene for Halloween. And you know, again, like with Black Christmas, you see, again, it's filmed in one big take for the killer's point of view. around some place. <laughs> Take off that thing. <laughs> Let's go upstairs. Okay. <laughs> and that's pretty much the end of the slasher period. Nowadays, slasher films don't get really made nowadays. They've been considered outdated, but every now and then, something really good comes along. Like in the 90s, there was Scream, I Know What You Did Last Summer, and Urban Legend. 2000s, there was The Strangers, and You're Next. But also around the 2000s, there was a huge trend of remakes, such as My Bloody Valentine, Friday the 13th, and Sorority Roll, all in the year of 2009. <laughs> which would seem to be its peak year. But then there's also been a trend of movies that have had slasher elements, like the Purge films, Happy Death Day, or Truth or Dare, all of which deviate from traditional horror film slasher conventions with unexpected twists. Another example is It Follows. This was a critical hit, mixing slasher style with demonic fantasy and metaphorical subtext. We have another group of young kids who are stalked by a killer, but it's not a human killer. But how it's filmed is like as if it was a slasher. <laughs> and then recently, there was a new installment of the Halloween franchise. 
But this sequel, it ignores all the sequels. It takes off right up from where the first one originally started, with Jamie Lee Curtis reprising her role. And the critics actually gave it much praise, saying that it was a return to form. Slasher films don't exactly get made nowadays, but clearly their influence stays. When you look at these films that I showed you, you realize where they get their power.